Welcome everyone to today's webinar on Millikan's Compression Training Academy. We will be covering Module 2, Understanding Compression Therapy. This is the second module of six in series. Follow-up information will be shared after this webinar on the dates and times for the upcoming modules. On behalf of Millikan, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we will touch on some housekeeping. Today's webinar will begin with the presentation followed by the question and answer session. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation by clicking on the dialog bubble with the Q&A noted and entering your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be available after the event on Millikan Healthcare YouTube page. If at any time the slides stop or the audio stops, exit out of the Microsoft Teams live event and rejoin. Please submit any technical questions you have into the same Q&A icon. We're here to help. Millikan & Company is a family-owned U.S.-based organization in business for more than 150 years. With expertise in textiles and chemicals, Millikan's healthcare division was formed with innovative products and technologies focused around improving patient lives together. Millikan Healthcare offers a variety of products and technologies, including ones available for addressing venous light ulcers, such as the Coflex TLC compression kit offerings. With that, I am pleased to welcome today's speaker, Claire Stevens, Millikan's clinical nurse specialist. Thank you, Claire, for being here today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Welcome to Millikan Healthcare Compression Training Academy a series of educational modules intended for healthcare professionals caring for patients with venous leg ulcers and complications of the lower limb requiring compression therapy. Welcome to module two, understanding compression therapy. This module presents the theory and science of compression therapy, different types of compression materials and bandage selection. This module will explore how compression works, the theories and science underpinning predicted sub-bandage pressure, the dynamics of therapeutic compression, different compression types, the characteristics of an ideal compression system, considerations for compression selection and patient benefits. In preparing this presentation, we have used and relied on information from public sources on the web. We therefore make no warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the underlying assumptions, estimates, data, or other information not generated by Millikan. Compression therapy is considered gold standard treatment for the management of chronic venous insufficiency, venous reflux, and associated conditions, including edema, venous leg ulceration and skin conditions such as venous eczema. The goal of compression therapy is to support the underlying venous system and structures, aid venous competence to improve venous return, reduce limb edema, decrease pain and increase leg ulcer healing rate. Compression therapy will be required for life to prevent chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms of venous reflux from recurring. Module one of this education series contains in-depth information on the causes of chronic venous insufficiency, the venous system and its structures, the veins, the valves and the calf muscle pump. Venous leg ulcers are a global healthcare challenge. The United Kingdom estimates prevalence between 0.1 and 0.3%. The United States of America, approximately 1.69%, with similar prevalence rates reported in parts of Europe. 
the annual cost of managing confirmed venous leg ulcers in the United Kingdom is reported to be between 500 and 900 million pounds. The United States of America estimate annual costs between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars and are consistent with European estimates, with Germany reporting cost to treat at between 9,900 and 10,800 euros. These figures continue to be challenged. Irwin et al in 2022 report lower costs in the United Kingdom through continual prevalence and reporting methodologies. The cost to the individual patient and impact on their quality of life is impossible to measure. Recurrence rates are reported to be between 26 and 69% at 12 months post healing. There are a plethora of evidence based policies and guidelines available, which have been designed to establish a global consensus approach toward leg ulcer management and selection of compression therapy, including the International Advisory Panel for Compression, who published a pathway cited in the European Wound Management Association compression documents. Compression therapy refers to the application of a semi-rigid sleeve, which could be a bandage, a garment, or a device to the limb, which has the ability to deliver a controlled level of external force or millimeters of mercury pressure, which are exerted from the outside onto the skin and tissue. These external pressure forces provide a squeeze and release effect, which support the internal venous system structures namely the veins, the valves and the calf muscle pump to increase deep vein blood flow competency. We will explore the squeeze and resistance of compression in more detail during this module. Externally applied compression reduces chronic venous insufficiency or venous reflux through supporting valve competence. Damaged valve cusps, which have become worn away, prevent competent opening and closure, allowing blood to backflow and cause reflux. The compression squeeze will support upward blood flow through the valves and prevent downward backflow. A squeeze and release cycle is most effective, which we will explore in more depth shortly. The calf muscle pump is supported by the external compression sleeve by increasing its ability to work with the compression material resistance, which results in an improved squeezing effect to maximise the emptying of the deep veins, thus reducing ambulatory venous pressure, accelerating capillary flow, which in turn will lead to reduced capillary leakage and reduced swelling or edema. The level of compression therapy selected for the management of patients with venous leg ulcers and associated conditions will be dependent upon several factors, including what a patient may be able to tolerate. But the fundamental deciding factor is that of safety based upon the level of underlying arterial insufficiency. An ankle brachial pressure index, also known as an ankle brachial index, is the most commonly used assessment tool to determine arterial insufficiency status. Module one of this educational series contains in-depth information on ankle brachial pressure index assessment and other assessment tools used to determine arterial insufficiency status. For the purpose of this educational module, we will use the terminology ABPI for ankle brachial pressure index. The ABPI index ranges suitable for compression therapy are an ABPI of 0.8 to less than or equal to 1.3, which indicates mild underlying peripheral arterial disease or normal, 
Therefore, standard compression can be used. So 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure is suitable for these patients. An ABPI greater than 0.5 or less than or equal to 0.8 indicates moderate underlying peripheral arterial disease. Therefore, light compression can be used. 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure may be used on these patients. There is, however, a great deal of disparity in the published literature regarding what a therapeutic compression level is and actual delivered levels of compression within the internal structures. External pressure levels range from 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, 35 to 40, etc. And are often quoted as being an actual number, for instance, 40 millimetres of mercury pressure rather than giving a range. Higher levels of compression, 60 to 70 millimetres of mercury pressure and often more, are desired and reported in some of the literature. However, it is widely reported and clinically accepted, including within the International Advisory Compression Pathway, that the levels to aim for are 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure to achieve light compression and 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure to achieve standard compression. The numbers often vary due to the type of compression materials being investigated and reported with differences for stockings, bandages and devices, number of layers, mode of delivery and country of origin. A good example being the United Kingdom aiming to always achieve 40 millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle based upon traditional four lay bandage beliefs and practices where as other European countries such as Germany aim to provide much greater levels of 50, 60 or even 70 millimetres of mercury pressure. Where these numbers are generated and how they are measured essentially relates to the theory of graduated compression and the use of Laplace's law. Since the 1980s, multi-layer compression bandaging methods, three and four layer, including the original Charing Cross bandage method, have been well reported in the literature as providing graduated compression with four layers specifically stated to achieve 40 millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle, graduating to 17 millimetres of mercury pressure at the knee. These numbers being underpinned by the use of the original Laplace law to predict the sub-bandage interface pressure. It soon became routine clinical practice and clinician belief that 40 millimetres of mercury pressure was being achieved despite details of the Laplace law not being clearly reported nor understood as to how the original law applied itself to the compression materials or to the human limb. The concept of graduation as the limb circumference increases and target 40 millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle has long been established in clinical practice. We will explore how the equation of Laplace to predict sub-bandage pressure was later adapted and how the concept relates to newer compression materials and methods available in clinical practice today. The original Laplace equation used to predict sub-bandage pressure is derived from a formula described independently by Thomas Young, 1773 to 1829, and by Pierre Simon de Laplace, 1749 to 1827, who described the law in 1805. This version defines the relationship between the pressure gradient across a closed elastic membrane or liquid film sphere and the tension in the membrane or film and was used to underpin compression bandages. 
In 1990, Steve Thomas recognised deficiencies using the original Laplace and adapted the equation to include bandage width and number of layers used specifically for compression bandage use. The adapted version relates pressure exerted by the bandage to the number of layers used, applied tension, limb circumference and width of the bandage. This adapted version has since featured in the published literature. Innovations in compression materials, such as the reduction in the number of layers used, improvements in materials and application methods have evolved compression significantly since 1990, raising the question of the appropriateness of Laplace to modern compression therapy materials and practice. In 2003, Thomas recognised deficiencies again and this time described the degree of compression produced by any bandage system is determined by complex interactions between four principal factors. Firstly, the physical structure and elastomeric properties of the bandage. He had recognised differences in new innovations. Secondly, the size and shape of the limb to which it was being applied. Thirdly, the skill and technique of the bandager. We will explore how new innovations have been developed to reduce variance in tension and application. And finally, Thomas described the nature of any physical activity undertaken by the patient. So the ability of the patient to work with the resistance of the compression materials being a principal factor. Despite the adaptations of Laplace law to relate more closely to compression bandages, there are further considerations to take into account which may affect the prediction of sub-bandage pressure. P represents the pressure calculation. However, materials have evolved with new technologies and innovations now affording more accurately measured and exerted pressure through the manufacturing process and material construction. N represents the number of layers. These have reduced consistently with several compression manufacturers aiming to improve the patient experience and quality of life. The number of layers have not only reduced, but the layers used are often now designed to bond to each other. This prevents movement between the layers and as such will have an impact on the interlayer behaviour. The number of layers being used has decreased from three to four layer, largely to two layer systems. T represents bandage tension. Inclusion of application safety features has improved dramatically. Bandages are often supported by visual indicators in combination with measured, more accurate stiffness and pressure delivery properties built within the materials. C represents limb circumference. This has largely been accepted as gradually increasing and as such compression levels theoretically will reduce. However, the human limb is neither a cylindrical object nor solid and may vary significantly between patients in relation to their tissue density, limb volume and fibrosis level. W represents bandage width. This has remained a constant for lower limb below knee application. If we look at measured compression or the T of Laplace, bandage tension features have evolved and are often supported by visual indicators which ensure correct tension at application combined with measured tension of the elastic or inelastic fibres within the materials. This results in a more accurate application of the bandage system and manufacturers of modern compression systems are then able to more accurately predict the millimetres of mercury pressure their compression systems are able to deliver. In 2003, 
Thomas acknowledged the influence of physical activity undertaken by the patient on subbandage pressure levels. This is referred to as static and dynamic stiffness index. Static stiffness index is the difference between standing and resting pressure and is a valuable parameter characterizing the efficacy of compression materials. Dynamic stiffness index is the change in subbandage pressure profiles during exercise. The pressure peaks and troughs shown in the graphs create an intermittent short duration venous occlusion, which are believed to reduce venous reflux and venous pressure. Subbandage pressure is therefore not an exact or a constant number. So despite recognising applied pressure will be influenced by Laplace law as the limb circumference increases, the static and dynamic resistance, which increases and decreases the pressure level during rest, standing, mobilisation and exercise are of significant importance. We will look at how the physical properties of bandages have the ability to create higher resistance and how the compression materials influence the static and dynamic pressure indexes. There are many different modes of delivery for compression therapy. Compression bandages. There are many bandage types available, manufactured using different materials and elastic fibres. They can be applied as one, two, three or four layers, aiming to achieve a desired subbandage pressure or resting pressure and deliver higher working pressures during wear. Light or standard compression levels are available. Ankle brachial pressure index to assess the underlying arterial insufficiency level will determine if light or standard compression levels are safe to be used. Many compression contact or first layers are dry. Traditionally, orthopedic wool or synthetic fibre type layers were used for protection and additional absorbency. More recently, lower profile foam contact layers have been introduced. Innovations have also introduced itch and odour control properties to these layers. Moist or medicated. Traditional paste bandages, including zinc or calamine, for multiple skin conditions related to chronic venous insufficiency, aim to relieve itch and soothe skin irritation. Traditionally, cotton gauze paste requiring a pleated application method, and latterly, an extensible foam infused to afford ease of use. Elastic or inelastic. Materials designed to deliver different therapeutic effects. We will explore these in more depth shortly, but these are often referred to short stretch or long stretch. So short stretch will be an inelastic and long stretch will be elastic. Disposable or reusable. A majority of modern compression bandage components and kits are designed as single patient use with a maximum wear time of seven days. Some inelastic components are reusable and washable often up to 50 times. This is usually considered to be a cost effective solution, but requires several other components and could also potentially be an infection prevention and management concern when a patient is washing their own bandage. There are intermittent compression devices or pumps available, which inflate and deflate to deliver high working and low resting pressures. Intermittent therapy can be convenient for the patient and used around their lifestyle or work commitments. However, it is reliant upon the patient adhering to the device use schedule. Compression hosiery, including socks, thigh highs, stockings, generally used as the long term post healing as a lifelong compression to prevent recurrence. Velcro garments with adjustable straps. These have become increasingly popular. Benefits include ease of use. Disadvantages include patients potentially removing or not wearing the garments between visits. 
custom fitted, particularly suitable in lymphedema due to the standard production garments not always accommodating altered limb shapes and sizes. There is no one size fits all. There are many patient quality of life and compliance or concordance considerations. Clinical effectiveness and ease of use considerations also need to be made. Traditionally, elastic or long stretch compression bandages have been classified as types 3A, 3B, 3C and 3D. There are currently no international or European wide consensus or standards. Britain, Germany and Switzerland have national standards. The Swiss standards have not been updated since 1975, so the standards followed tend to be the updated British and German standards. Disparity exists between the millimetres of mercury pressure profiles within these two standards. Type 3A are light compression bandages and deliver ankle pressure profiles. British standard less than 20 and German 18.4 to 21.2 millimetres of mercury pressure. Type 3B are light, also termed moderate in British standards, compression bandages and deliver ankle pressure profiles, British standard 21 to 30 and German 25.1 to 32.1 millimetres of mercury pressure. Type 3C are moderate, also termed high in British standards, compression bandages and deliver ankle pressure profiles, British standard 31 to 40 and German 36.4 to 46.5 millimetres of mercury pressure. Type 3D are high, also termed extra high in British standards, compression bandages and deliver ankle pressure profiles, British standard 41 to 60 and German greater than 59 millimetres of mercury pressure. This classification does not include inelastic or short stretch, newer innovative bandage materials and hybrid systems, so has become less relevant to modern day compression practice. Compression hosiery is generally available in classes one to three and in class four within the German and French standards. Hosiery is prescribed for patients for the treatment of several conditions, including varicose veins, management of edema and for venous leg ulcer prevention of recurrence. There is no global or European consensus or standard and different classification systems exist in terms of the thresholds applied to the classes. The classes and pressure ranges differ for British, German, French, draft European and USA standards. The draft European standard has been abandoned due to a lack of consensus. The differences in millimetres of mercury pressure between these classes can vary significantly. Class 1, British 14 to 17, German 18 to 21, French 10 to 15, USA 15 to 20. Class 2, British 18 to 24, German 23 to 32, French 15 to 20, USA 20 to 30. Class 3, British 25 to 35, German 34 to 46, French 20 to 36, USA 30 to 40. Class 4, there is no British or USA class 4 standard. German greater than 49 millimetres of mercury pressure and French greater than 36 millimetres of mercury pressure. Short stretch or inelastic materials are usually positioned for patients who are active and mobile. For those who are able to work with the bandage to generate peak pressures through material resistance, often positioned as being less suited to the inactive patient or those unable to dorsal flex or have a fixed ankle joint. 
Short stretch bandages deliver high working pressures and lower resting pressures. Working when the patient works and resting when the patient is at rest. Due to the low elasticity of the materials, short stretch generates good resistance to deliver high working pressures. These types of bandages do not produce peak pressures or tighten at rest or during patient inactivity, making them more comfortable for patients to wear, particularly at night. Inelastic or short stretch bandages tend to generate a higher static and dynamic stiffness index than elastic materials and are able to generate intermittent high pressure peaks during standing, mobilising and exercise with lower resting pressures when inactive. The diagram shows a resting pressure at approximately 30 millimetres of mercury pressure with peak resistance pressures between 60 to 70 millimetres of mercury pressure. These pressures are intermittent, not constant, and will aid venous return through the on-off squeeze and release effect. Short stretch inelastic compression bandage materials contain few or even no elastic fibres and therefore have little extensibility or stretch, producing high resistance for the calf muscle pump to work against. Examples of bandages constructed from different materials. Image one is an example of a short stretch compression bandage, which is constructed of 100% cotton woven into what the manufacturers term as textile elastic construction. But this contains no elastic. We are referring to Compriland type material in image one. Image two is an example of a cohesive short stretch compression bandage containing some elastic fibres. In this example, we are referring to a coflex type bandage material. The applied bandage forms a semi rigid sleeve around the limb to support the venous system and in particular the calf muscle which then works against the resistance when standing, static stiffness index, and during exercise, dynamic stiffness index to empty the deep vein. Short stretch bandages deliver high working pressures and lower resting pressures, generating higher intermittent peak pressures, which actively support the venous system structures, the veins, the valves, and the calf muscle pump, aiding venous return. The traditionally used Una boot was invented in 1896 by the German dermatologist Paul Gerson Una. Layer 1, an inelastic cotton gauze coated with zinc or calamine, and layer 2, a long stretch elastic cohesive bandage, often requiring a middle layer, usually an orthopaedic wool type bandage, to allow bonding of the cohesive layer as it is unable to bond over the moist zinc layer. Innovations have since produced a moisture resistant cohesive layer, which enables bonding over a moist layer. This allows practitioners to maintain fewer bandage layers and provide a lower profile bandage system. Despite being referred to as a short stretch system, the Una boot components produce a hybrid system, layer one inelastic and layer two elastic. Layer one, the cotton gauze, is not extensible and requires careful application to allow for limb swelling. Traditionally, a pleated application method is used and can be very time consuming to apply. This has led to new innovations being developed, which utilise a slightly more extensible layer one material, allowing a more simple spiral application method. The gauze is coated with the zinc or calamine, therefore application can be very messy. Again, new innovations have aimed to address this messy application through the zinc or calamine being infused into a low profile foam layer rather than coated onto a cotton gauze. 
This method also ensures delivery of all of the active ingredient to the patient's limb. Layer one forms a semi-rigid sleeve as it dries to create high resistance. The calf muscle is then able to work against the external structure when standing or exercising. Unabu delivers high working and low resting pressure, generating higher intermittent peak pressures, which actively supports the veins, the valves and the calf muscle pump to aid venous return. The zinc or calamine also manage dermatological conditions associated to chronic venous insufficiency with relief of symptoms of itch and skin irritation. Long stretch or elastic materials are less rigid than short stretch and usually positioned for patients who are less active or immobile. For those who are unable to work with the bandage to generate peak pressures through material resistance, long stretch elastic is positioned as being less suited to active patients. Long stretch bandages deliver a low working pressure and high resting pressure. Due to the high elasticity of the materials, long stretch offers lower resistance, delivering lower working pressures. Resting pressures are high as the bandage exerts a constant pressure or force to the limb at rest or during inactivity. Sometimes this option can be less comfortable for patients to wear, particularly at night. Elastic or long stretch bandages generate a lower static and dynamic stiffness index as they provide less resistance, therefore create lower pressure peaks if the patient were able to stand, mobilise or exercise. Elastic long stretch materials provide slightly higher resting pressures. The diagram shows a resting pressure of 40 millimetres of mercury pressure with peak pressures reaching 50 to 52 millimetres of mercury pressure. These pressures appear dampened in comparison to the previously seen short stretch in elastic pressure profiles and will not deliver comparable dynamic squeeze and release to the venous system structures. Long stretch elastic compression bandage materials contain elastic fibres and therefore have greater extensibility or stretch resulting in less resistance. Constructed from different materials containing different types of elastic fibres. Image one is an example of a non-cohesive compression bandage which contains elastic fibres. And image two is an example of a cohesive elastic compression bandage, which contains elastic fibres. The applied bandage forms a less rigid or more extensible sleeve around the limb. Long stretch bandages deliver low working and high resting pressure, more suited to the less active patient or those who are immobile, have a fixed ankle joint or inadequate calf muscle. The calf muscle is unable to work against the external structure as the patient is inactive and the bandage has higher elasticity than a short stretch bandage. Higher intermittent peak pressures are not generated, but instead a higher constant resting pressure supports the venous system. For any compression therapy to be effective, it must first be accepted and tolerated by the patient and aim to enhance, not inhibit their quality of life. Patient desirables. This list is not exhausted and may include a good aesthetic appearance when applied, that it does not itch during wear, that it does not restrict a patient's mobility, their activity levels or lifestyle choices that the applied compression resists odour, especially when wear time expectations can be up to seven days, that it is comfortable during wear and does not cause additional pain and discomfort, especially at night disrupting their sleep, that it does not slip down or unwind, but stays in place between applications, that it is cool and lightweight to wear, especially during the summer months and in warmer climates, Patients desire the ability to look their normal self, 
to wear their own clothes and footwear and not have a bulky bandage on show. Many patients have stated that they do not want everyone to know they have a leg problem, which a bulky bandage can advertise. Characteristics a clinician may seek will be a combination of both patient desirables and clinical considerations, including safety and ease of use. Accurate compression level is paramount for patient safety and for clinician reassurance that the desired compression level is achieved to prevent under or over compression leading to skin damage or worse. Innovative compression materials and manufacturing processes combined with the use of visual indicators increases accuracy and safety. Non-allergic. Where possible, compression materials should be free from any ingredients known to cause allergies, such as being free from latex. Comfort. The compression will be worn both day and night by the patient and it is therefore critical that they are comfortable, that the bandage does not impact on their sleep or increase pain levels. If compression becomes uncomfortable, it is at risk of being removed by the wearer and even resisted as an intervention in the future. Lightweight. Edematous limbs already feel heavy to the patients, so the bandage layers should be kept to a minimum to reduce additional material weight and be breathable to prevent further increased weight from excess wound fluids and general moisture. Low profile, to enable wearing of usual clothes and footwear, the patient is able to look and feel their more normal self. Easy to learn, easy to teach others and easy to select. Considerations here will include use of a kit rather than selection of components for safety and ease of use. The desire for easy selection so clinicians are not overwhelmed with too wide a selection of products. Having fewer and less complicated application techniques will reduce the potential for layer application error. It will also ease the onboard training of new colleagues. Compression should be conformable to aid ease of application and be able to adapt to a wide range of limb shapes and sizes affected by conditions such as edema. Inelastic or elastic. Ideally, that both are available for selection to deliver the most appropriate therapeutic resting and working pressures for your patient's needs. Sustained compression. Compression should sustain and not lose applied pressure over time. Mechanisms such as cohesive bonding are used to sustain applied tension and prevent interlayer movement. Allow functionality. Compression should not restrict ankle movement or mobility and become counterproductive. That it should be non-slip to prevent bandage failure, skin damage, displacement edema and improve patient comfort and overall patient outcomes. Module 1 discussed ankle brachial pressure index and its importance in the selection of compression therapy. The patient's underlying arterial status is the most important consideration when deciding to initiate compression therapy. An ankle brachial pressure index assessment must be completed to screen for the presence and severity of underlying arterial insufficiency. Failure to identify arterial disease prior to initiating compression therapy can lead to very serious consequences for the patient. Specific ankle brachial pressure index ranges are appropriate for light compression treatment and standard compression treatment. Light compression is indicated for patients with an ankle brachial pressure index value equal to or greater than 0.5 to less than 0.8, or those with mixed venous with an underlying arterial insufficiency. Standard compression is indicated for patients with an ankle brachial pressure index value equal to or greater than 0.8 to less than 1.3, or those with venous insufficiency 
with mild or no underlying arterial insufficiency. Compression therapies measured in millimetres of mercury pressure. Light compression will fall between 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure and standard compression will fall between 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. Another key factor to consider is the patient's skin condition. Is the skin intact or is it irritated by conditions associated to chronic venous insufficiency such as venous eczema? Activity level needs to be evaluated to understand if short or long stretch compression will be the most appropriate. Patient tolerance of compression can be managed with the use of light compression as a precursor to using standard compression and in those unable to tolerate standard compression. It is important to understand the indications for compression use and when compression is contraindicated. Indications for compression use are for venous leg ulcers, where there is chronic venous insufficiency, where an ankle brachial pressure index is equal to or greater than 0 0.8, the patient can be for standard compression, 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. Mixed leg ulcers, where the patient has chronic venous insufficiency with an underlying arterial insufficiency, an ankle brachial pressure index, which is equal to or greater than 0 0.5, the patient can have light compression, 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury pressure. In general, compression is indicated for active or healed leg ulcers, lower limb edema, lymphedema, the treatment of varicose veins, for tired, aching legs secondary to venous disease, to manage skin changes due to venous insufficiency, and for the prevention and treatment of deep vein thrombosis, for instance, compression use during pregnancy. Contraindications for the use of compression include uncompensated organ failure, whether that be heart, liver, renal, advanced peripheral obstructive arterial disease, where an ankle brachial pressure index is less than 0 0.5 or greater than 1.3, cellulitis or septic phlebitis, untreated wound infection, abscesses, advanced peripheral neuropathy. Compression should not be used. Thank you for completing module two, Understanding Compression Therapy of the Millikan Healthcare Compression Training Academy. There are five additional modules in our Compression Academy series. Module one, Leg Ulcers and Conditions Affecting the Lower Limb, explores lower limb physiology, assessment, investigation, and venous leg ulcer differential diagnosis. Module 3, Compression Therapy in Practice, explores and compares various bandage materials, application methods, ease of use, ease of training, patient safety and competency, how to correctly apply, how to achieve and sustain desired levels of compression. This module includes compression, frequently asked questions and training competency framework example. Module 4, Wound Management Principles with Compression Therapy, explores best practice skin care, wound care, exudate management and infection management and prevention strategies combined with compression therapy. Module 5, supports home care practice, patient information and patient care advice materials for looking after compression at home preventing recurrence, skin management, diet, exercise and hosiery. Module 6 provides clinical evidence summaries to support your compression practice and how to set up and run a clinical evaluation with data template example. Thank you, Claire, for another great presentation. Attendees, we will now begin today's question and answer session. In addition to Claire, Millikan's clinical nurse specialist, Susan DeBack, is here with us to answer your questions. We have just under 10 minutes remaining within this webinar. You can submit your questions 
You have by clicking on the Q&A dialog bubble icon in the Teams console and type in your questions there. So with that, we have one question coming through. Uh, which is better, short or long stretch compression? Susan, I'll send that over to you. Okay, so which is better, short stretch or long stretch? We get asked this quite a bit, but there's really no great difference in the healing rates between the two systems. Research um, supports the concept of bandage stiffness um, of the multi-layer system, and that explains why we have um, quite similar healing rates between the two types of bandages. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you're welcome. Claire, I'll send over a question to you. Is it okay to use short stretch compression on active or less active patients? Um, thank you, Naomi. Um, there is a common myth that you should never use a short stretch bandage on patients who are inactive. So from the module, we've just learned that um, the dynamics are stimulated by uh, resistance against that bandage. Um, however, uh, Hugo Parch uh, published a lot of work which actually clearly demonstrated as long as the patient can do a dorsal flex, wiggle their toes or even cough, you can get uh, a response from a short stretch uh, bandage. Thank you, Claire. Susan, looks like we got another question coming through. Does an ABI differ with short stretch versus a long stretch or is the range the same? Well, um, as Claire went through in the module, um, it actually, the, the range is the same for both short stretch and long stretch. You really want to be cognizant of the mobility of the patient when choosing long stretch or short stretch. So you, uh, I'll just reiterate what Claire said. Um, you just need an ABI um, for a light compression would be the um, 0.5 to 0 0.8. And then the um, for standard um, compression, you would want the 0 0.8 to 1.3. And obviously, we go by WCN guidelines here. So if you use something different, please go by that. Claire, do you have anything to add? No, uh, the um, international uh, pathway guidelines um, are where you tend to see uh, those recommendations. And, and you've just mentioned the guideline that you you use in the United States. So, so really, those um, those indications for light and standard on ABPI um, are for any type of bandage. It's, it's the, the levels that are for compression um, and then you will select whether you want long stretch, short stretch uh, based on other therapeutical needs uh, of your patient. Thank you. Thank you both. We have another question. Claire, I'll pitch this one over to you. Is there a risk to skin integrity from the peak SSI DSI pressures achieved during exercise? Um, so uh, thinking back to uh, when we saw the graphs with the peak pressures um, on the uh, static stiffness index for a short stretch bandage and um, the fact that, it, it, you know, the higher pressures can reach 70, 80, 90, actually sometimes can even go off a scale of 120. Um, it, it's understandable that you would think, um, you know, am I putting the, the patient's skin integrity by exerting such high pressures? But what we have to understand is that that pressure is held for such a short period of time. So it's like a squeeze and release. Um, so you would actually be giving more of a therapeutic on off effect uh, to, this, to the skin. Uh, if that pressure was constant, yes. Uh, but as it's an intermittent pressure, um, it, it ultimately gives like a massage effect to, to the skin. But, you know, yes, we always observe uh, skin integrity. 
Thank you, Claire. Susan, I got another one for you. Should we be focused on the applied sub bandage interface pressure when considering compression during wear? Um, you know, during the wear, the SSI and the um, dynamic, um, they're going to deliver a therapeutic compression effect. So pressure is greater than the applied sub bandage pressure come into force. So you really, um, I don't believe you need to be focused on that. Claire, if you have more. Um, no, I absolutely agree with you, Susan. Um, I, I think um, that the more that you look at uh, where sub bandage ap applied pressures and their interface pressures, um, and I mentioned um, and I have to hold my hand up and say clinically, I, I was one of the people who genuinely believed that I was giving 40 millimetres of mercury pressure on every patient that I bandaged until I started to explore and delve into, you know, new innovations, delve into the research. And then um, there is a significance. There's a quality indicator. There's there's um, a significance to us all having, you know, our compression available, uh, you know, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. But Susan, you're absolutely right. It's the therapeutic effect of that compression that comes into force. Uh, and, and so the significance on your interface, applied interface pressure um, takes on less significance. So, yeah, absolutely agree with Susan on, on that. Thank you. And that looks like the last of the questions that we have for right now. So that'll wrap up the time for today. The Millican team will be responding and following up on any questions that you may have after the webinar. Um, so just so you know, we will be in touch. Claire, thank you again for an information packed presentation today. And thank you as well to Susan for your helpful insight on today's question and answer session. A follow up email will be sent out containing information regarding upcoming modules and a post webinar survey. We would love to get your feedback. Again, this recording will be available on the Millican Healthcare YouTube page. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope that you have a great rest of the day.